of a, a nutshell of what we got going at Pape Dawson right now. All right. Well, Dennis, thank you for that. Um, good to have a solid sponsor like Pape Dawson to continue su to support our organization. Um, this time, we'd like to start the announcements. Uh, Paul, if we could uh, cue those up. All right. Thank you, Sam. Dennis, I apologize. Looks like I neglected to include your slides uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, but thank you for uh, uh, rolling with the punches. Uh, we're going to start off announcements uh, with Austin Hel Helton talking about uh, sponsorships. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and thanks, Pete Dawson and Dennis. Really appreciate y'all sponsoring today's meeting, uh, as Sam and Paul mentioned. Um, as Sam talked about, you know, as getting sponsorships um, from firms around Austin is one of our main ways or resources to provide us revenue um, to contribute to charitable contributions, uh, along with providing scholarships to um, locals in the Austin area. Um, so I encourage everybody here to reach out to your firms, talk to them about being a sponsor. I know I've reached out to multiple people and multiple firms recently. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, email is shown here on the slide, um, or you can reach me at my uh, work email at austin.helton at kinleyhorn.com. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Austin. Uh, and I don't think Scott is able to join us uh, today. Uh, he's having some uh, winter storm issues uh, as well. Um, so I'll present here for uh, SEI. Uh, two things to note. Um, number one, uh, next month's ASCE luncheon uh, will be hosted by SEI, uh, and they're going to have uh, Mark Wagoner from Walter P. Moore talk about the new uh, Austin Football Club Stadium uh, being built here in, in North Austin. Uh, so that should be pretty exciting. Um, and then SET talks uh, are still uh, hopefully on the agenda. They are playing by ear um, and, and hopefully we get uh, the other <laughs> major issue going on, the, the pandemic under control, uh, and they're able to host those again uh, in the very near future. Um, up next is going to be uh, Travis to talk about EWRI. All right, so our EWRI scholarship is open right now. Um, it's due March 12th. You can find links to that uh, both in the ASE newsletter, our EWRI newsletter, and on the website. Um, so we have seven scholarships for a total of about like, $7,000. Um, and then also we're still planning our continuing education workshop, we're looking at a mid to late July timeframe. Uh, we're looking at, you know, maybe doing it virtual, but also we're booking the Pickle Center just in case things clear up by then. Um, so our theme will come out soon, as well as a list of speakers. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you, Travis. Uh, and now I'm going to talk again uh, about uh, YMF uh, happy hour coming up uh, Thursday, March 25th. Uh, so in a little more than a month. Uh, looks like uh, there will be gift cards uh, and the, the game will be code names. Uh, if you've not played code names before, uh, it is fun. Oh, it's a joint EWRI happy hour. Travis, you should have mentioned. Uh, sorry. Um, so uh, join if you can, uh, gift cards uh, and a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, YMF uh, scholarship is also open. Uh, to high school seniors. Uh, the deadline for applications is April 16th. Uh, so if you uh, know anybody who may be interested in that, please forward. Uh, please feel free to, to share that as widely as possible. Uh, and we have one final uh, announcement. We have a guest speaker today, uh, Vivian Young from Central Texas Food Bank wants to say a few words. Uh, Vivian, are you ready? Yes, I am. And it's all yours. All right. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you all so much for, you know, having me here today. And uh, all of us at, you know, the Central Texas Food Bank, we are so appreciative and, and thankful for the support that all of y'all have provided to us, you know, especially with camp pandemic and then now on top of that the winter storm that no one expected to come through Texas. Um, so just to kind of give you all some quick numbers and updates um, with what you know we've been going through with COVID. So right now the food bank we've continued to meet the needs of those facing hunger um, through our mobile food pantries, partner agencies, and we're doing the special drive-through mass distributions. And so the unprecedented demand led us to distribute a record of 64.5 million pounds of food in fiscal 2020. Um, we served 297,000 individuals a month in fiscal year 2020, which is a 25% increase from fiscal year 2019. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the the need that we've seen, you know, in 2020, um, it's been crazy. Um, and so if you can go to the next slide. Oh, and here is just, you know, our mission uh, to nourish hungry people and lead the community in the fight against hunger. Keep going. So just to kind of give you all some information on the food bank, um, we do cover 21 counties across central Texas, which is twice the size of Massachusetts. Um, and here you can see in the picture, the counties that we are covering. And, um, you know, we see a lot of need, especially in these rural areas around um, on the side. So, you know, we're, we wouldn't be able to serve this many counties without, you know, all of the community members who support us um, and also our partner agencies. Maybe you can go to the next slide. So this kind of gives you a visual of how the food bank works. You know, we receive donations from individuals, corporate partners, retailers like HEB um, and all of that. And we purchase the food, get them as donations to the food bank. We then distribute them to you know, our partner agencies, mobile food pantries, programs, and social services. And then that is when the food will get distributed out to the community. And if you can go to the next slide. So with these, uh, you know, on top of the COVID updates I gave you all in the beginning, um, we are seeing a lot more clients. There's a lot more food served. And we're also seeing a lot of new clients as well. Um, especially with COVID and a lot of people, you know, losing their jobs. And so it's the numbers have just been really high and really crazy. And so once again, you know, we're thankful for everyone who's helping us out. And the next slide, please. And so this is just to touch again on, you know, the new distribution model that we are doing to make sure that everyone is staying safe. And the next slide. And I uh, just wanted to thank you all again. Um, you know, in 15 years, first drive was in 2005. So you guys have been a continued um, support for the food bank and y'all have raised total of $16,153, which creates 64,364 meals. Um, so we are so thankful for that. And, you know, we know our clients are thankful as well. And, um, you know, we look forward to continue working with y'all. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, that's really great to hear from you. We appreciate it, and we're we're happy to support such a such a worthy cause. So thank you for joining today. And with that, uh, I think I'll go ahead and introduce today's speakers. Uh, so we're going to have two speakers today: uh, Paul Belimowitz, uh, principal and senior project manager at Page, and John Raff. Deputy Executive Director of Facilities Design and Construction at the Texas Facilities Commission. At PAGE, Paul has served as the lead architect on several major projects, including two additions to ABIA, uh, a surgical and critical care expansion to Scott and White's University Medical Center in Round Rock, and a semiconductor manufacturing expansion for a division of Boeing in Silmar, California. Paul has served in volunteer positions at the local AIA Austin chapter since 2006 and was awarded the 2009 Texas Society of Architects Young Professional Achievement Award. In 2014, 
Paul was nominated for the position of TXA president, a three-year commitment beginning in 2015. In 2007, he helped organize a design competition for an underdeveloped parkland site in a lower income area of East Austin, which resulted in the city of Austin receiving a $500,000 grant from Texas Parks and Wildlife to help transform the site into Gus Garcia Park. Paul and the other founders of Gus Garcia Park competition team uh, received a certificate of appreciation from the Austin City Council for their efforts benefiting the community. Since May of 2010, John Raff has served as the Deputy Executive Director over the Facilities Design and Construction Division of TFC. His current responsibilities include the executive leadership and administration of 62 employees, as well as the strategic planning for a significant portion of the core functions of the agency. During this period, RAF has overseen TFC's execution of construction projects with a portfolio ranging from 80 to 100 projects and a value ranging between 200 million and currently $1.7 billion. RAF has administered the agency's policies to provide maximum opportunity and healthy competition among the agency's many vendors and as a result, obtain maximum end value for the state. RAF began working for TFC in 2005 as a project manager and resident structural engineer. Prior to state service, he enjoyed a 25 year career in the private sector as a structural engineering consultant with 20 of those years employed by a prominent hub certified consulting firm. Uh, and with that, Paul, are you ready to take over? I am. All right. All right, can everyone see my screen? I can. Excellent, so thank you for that introduction. So we are here to talk about, and I can stop my slides from skipping ahead. Uh, we're here to talk about the Texas Capitol Complex and we've got some exciting things happening downtown. Uh, some of y'all may be aware of this already, but we wanted to start off by talking a little bit of the background of the master plan for the Capitol Complex and talk about the design of phase one, which is currently under construction. Give y'all an update of where construction is at on phase one. And then we'll have John talk a little bit about some of the upcoming opportunities with phase two. So Paige has been working with Texas Facilities Commission since 2013. Uh, we released the 2016 Texas Capital Complex Master Plan, uh, which really provides a vision for how to manage the property and that the state owns in central Austin, right around the Capitol. It's about a 40 block area. You can kind of see in the rendering here in this image, it's more than just the Capitol itself. There's a lot of state offices around the Capitol that form the Capitol complex. The master plan had some very high level goals and visions uh, that came out of the master planning process. The first one is really providing state office space. And that's really what the charge of Texas Facilities Commission is. And we've got a lot of state offices and state agencies that were in leased spaces and one of the things that we analyzed looking at the financials is that the state could do a lot better financially by owning and operating their own buildings long term rather than leasing space. And so that's one of the core principles of the master plan and the implementation of phase one is getting some of the state agencies out of leases and into state owned facilities. There's several other uh, several other visions and goals out of the master plan really about making this a civic space. We really wanna make sure that the capital complex is a destination for Texans. This is the work that we're doing is an investment in the state, but it's investment in Texans because we're using public funds to create these. The capital building itself is a destination. So is the uh, uh, state history museum. And we wanted to be able to leverage those to really make this a greater destination for Texans and really creating civic spaces. We want this to be a space that can be used by all Texans. And then we also wanted to link with gateways through other areas around the capital complex and really open it up to make sure it's more welcoming to others. So with improving those connections, we also wanted to define boundaries, but then also create vibrant streets so that they're walkable and it's a space that's really pleasant for everyone to enjoy. So when we look at that first goal of looking at adding office space within the capital complex, we looked at the properties and where are there opportunities to be able to increase the office building stock within the capital complex. And so as some of you may be aware, there are 
view corridors of the Capitol building that limit and restrict height of buildings around the Capitol. There's also a dome-shaped uh, restriction called the Capitol Dominance Zone, which limits the heights of buildings directly around the Capitol building itself. And so this limits where we could actually put new buildings or where we could uh, expand. So this 3D overlay shows where those capital view corridors kind of slice over the different properties with opportunities for new office stock. And so what this really told us is it really told us that on the north end of Congress Avenue near MLK, that's really where we had the majority of the opportunity for, for adding office space to the capital complex. And so this really directed us towards uh, where we needed to invest in phase one. So this is an image of the existing conditions of the capital complex roughly around 2016. And then this is a rendering of the amount of potential building stock that could be increased within the capital complex. And so there's a lot of opportunity, it's kind of going back and forth here, there's a lot of opportunity to really invest in and leverage the asset that the state has in this property. And so then we looked at how do we implement this? And so we looked at those view corridors and I was mentioning that really pushed us towards the north end of the capital complex. So phase one implementation as recommended by the master plan was to create two new state office buildings right on what was Congress Avenue, which brings over a million gross square feet of new space to the capital complex for relocating state agencies out of leases and into state-owned buildings. And then also to create, uh, to, to support the other goals of the master plan with making civic connections and public spaces, Congress Avenue is vacated to cars and we're making what is called the new Capitol Mall, which is gonna be an outdoor green space linking the capital complex and providing an axial entranceway and front door on the north side to the Capitol complex, framing the view of the Capitol. Other metrics of phase one, we're providing over 3,000 parking spaces. Uh, some of you may have seen the big dig that we had where Congress Avenue used to be. Uh, we're putting all of the parking underground, except for a small above ground garage uh, with the north building. But putting the parking underground really opens up the ground plane and really makes that a more pedestrian friendly space. There's a lot of surface parking lots within the capital complex, and that's really not the best use of the land for the capital complex. And so we looked at putting that parking underground, and then that really does free up the ground, Spain, ground plane for more interactive uses that connect people within the complex. Uh, we've also relocated the childcare facility and some of the support spaces that will support the capital complex and the office workers for the state. So the 1601 Congress office building, which is the smaller of the two in phase one, the 1601 Congress office building has a new childcare facility. And then it also has a shared conferencing center on the second floor that's used by all state employees available to all agencies. The, the North building, the 1801 Congress building is the larger of the two. It's a little over 600,000 gross square feet. And it also has a, a space on the ground floor for a cultural venue that could then harmonize with the State History Museum across the street and the Plant and Art Museum across MLK, which is also undergoing some renovations right now. And then lastly, a new central utility plant to provide district cooling for this whole area, both all three phases of implementation for the master plan. So then phase two and phase three, which are planned. So phase two is two additional state office buildings shown in orange here in the image on the left. And those two buildings comprise about 525,000 gross square feet in those two buildings. Uh, we're also going to do additional underground parking, about 2,500 parking spaces with phase two, and then also completing the fourth block of the Capitol Mall connecting to the Capitol grounds. Phase two has been funded, and John's going to talk a little bit more later about some of the upcoming solicitations that will be coming out soon for phase two. Phase three, which is planned in the master plan, is an additional two buildings next to phase two. So about 530 gross square feet and two new buildings, and then additional 2,400 parking spaces also underground. So we talked a little bit about connectivity being one of the goals. When you look at where the Capitol complex is, it is right in the heart of Austin and really in a, within a, a great location in the urban space in the city. 
And so there's so many wonderful things happening around Austin. I mentioned the Blanton Museum to the north, which is right where UT Speedway Avenue connects. The Blanton Museum is a, a wonderful civic asset and it's great to be able to connect with that with the civic venues that we have within the Capitol complex with the Texas State History Museum and a future civic venue in the 1801 Congress building. So it's really great to have that uh, symbiosis connectivity at the north end of the Capitol complex. There's also some wonderful things happening on the east side of the Capitol complex with the Health District, Dell Medical School, Central Health, Waterloo Park. So really great investments that the city is making and, and other investors are making in Austin right around the Capitol complex. And the state is making investments as well to really leverage this area. So within the Capitol complex with the added uh, numbers of people that we're going to have, we had to look at transportation and we had to look at how do we get people in and out of the Capitol complex. And so one of the things that we looked at was all of the one-way roads with 16th, 17th, and 18th Street. And we looked at how we, could, how we could increase capacity on those. So what we actually did is we looked at taking away some of the surface parking. Since we're putting so much underground parking, we, could, uh, we eliminated some of the uh, curbside street parking. And that enabled us to get an extra lane of traffic on 16th, 17th, and 18th Street. If you look at the diagram to the right, you also see the 17th Street, which is in the middle, is discontinuous right at the Capitol Mall. That's because we're actually using 17th Street to ramp down into the new underground parking. So both the Eastern and Western access down 17th Street will be leading you directly down into that below grade parking to make sure we have great access in and out of that large garage. The diagram on the bottom left is how we're treating 16th and 18th Street and how they cross the mall. And so when we think about the Capitol Mall, we really wanted that to be a pedestrian friendly space. And so with that, we wanted to make sure those intersections where the roads cross the mall, that it was really about pedestrians being the primary and really having a space where the cars were entering a pedestrian space, not pedestrians entering a, cross, a car space where you typically have a crosswalk. And so what we did is a speed table where we picked up the ground and continue the pavers of the mall straight across and then cars ramp up on either side and then cross on the, you know, the pavers so that we have a change in pavement, you know, change in texture. And so traffic calming devices like the change in texture, like the ramp to help reduce speeds of vehicles to make it safer for the pedestrians on the mall. So these are some of the cross sections of kind of before and after of some of the roads. So when we look at 16th, 17th and 18th, the upper image shows the single lane of traffic for the one-way street with parking on both sides. And then the lower level, or the lower image shows two lanes of traffic going two ways with parking only on one side. And so that really helped us both just the number of cars that the road can carry by having that second lane, and then also having it go two way to give people more options or directions for how they can get in and out of the Capitol complex, which really helped uh, with some of the transportation concerns. So here's a cross section of the Capitol Mall. So you can see Congress Avenue on the upper image where it was one lane of traffic both ways. But now you look below on the new image where we've got the Capitol Mall, where it's a 50 foot wide green space down the center that really frames the Capitol building. And then broad walkways on both sides with double rows of oak trees providing a lot of shade on those walkways to really make this a very pedestrian friendly space really make this a family friendly space as well with opportunities for picnics and then opportunities for people to gather in small little intimate spaces below the trees. This is showing some of the activities that are planned within the mall. So we wanted to make sure the space was activated and we wanted to make sure that when people came there that they had amenities to help them and, and support the people that would be coming to the site. So we wanted to make sure there were food opportunities there's a new cafe being planned in the 1601 building. We talked a little bit about a new cultural venue that's planned for the 1801 building. And so we wanted to make sure that with those food opportunities, play areas for kids, uh, shopping opportunities with potentially a gift shop with a cultural venue. We wanted to make sure that, that there were those opportunities for people to, uh, to have those resources when they're, when they're trying to visit the mall and experience the mall. So this is just a concept rendering of what we, what the vision was of this space. Again, trying to make it active. 
This is really a civic destination. We want to make sure that it's available to all Texans. And so we want this to be an active space and to be used for things, whether it's the Texas Book Festival, MS150, events like that that can utilize this space uh, throughout the course of the year. So talking a little bit about some of the architectural concepts of the buildings. So with the master plan, there were several architectural design guides that were identified covering all range of things from massing all the way to timelessness and identity of this campus. And so one of the things uh, that we did want to talk about was fabric and focus. And so when we think about the 1801 building, it's really an anchor on the corner of, of MLK and Congress. And we really look to that to be a focus building. Whereas the 1601 building is really more about framing that view of the Capitol. So it's more about being a fabric building. So those two buildings really, really define that concept of focus versus fabric buildings in the Capitol complex. So here you can see some design studies with the Capitol Mall. And then what we're teaming Museum Plaza, where we've got the existing Texas State History Museum, the Blanton Art Museum, and then a cultural venue in 1801 Congress. And so really kind of leveraging that civic space as kind of an anchor at the end of the Capitol Mall opposite from the Capitol. The diagram on the bottom right really shows how the architecture of the 1801 building really is, is mimicking what's happening with the Texas State History Museum. The Texas State History Museum kind of pulls back a little bit towards MLK, really opening up. And we really liked how that opens up the end of the mall to be a welcoming gesture. And so the 1801 building does the same thing. So if you look at the image on the left, you can see how the office portions that are against MLK are set back. And there's also vertical setbacks that, that align with the height of the Texas State History Museum. So we're using those existing buildings to kind of uh, inform the massing of these new buildings. And then if you look down the mall, you can see kind of the red facades or the red diagramming of the facades that are really all about framing that view of the Capitol. We really want to make sure that the Capitol is still the most dominant the most dominant building within the Capitol complex. We want the other buildings as those fabric buildings to really support that, uh, that deferential nature to the Capitol. So here's a 3D image of the scope of phase one. So here you can see the 1801 Congress building on the left, 1601 Congress on the right. Again, between those buildings, it's about a million gross square feet of office space for the state. You can also see the Capitol Mall, the first three blocks that are in phase one. You can also see the ramps coming down from 17th Street that provide a lot of access down into the, into the underground parking. There's also garage access underneath the 1801 building as well. And so three points of access to this underground mall. The other thing you can see is just next to the Capitol Mall, there's some small structures that are portals. And those are all about connecting people from the underground parking up to the mall. We really thought it was important to make sure that we bring people up to the mall and, and they have that access when they're, whether they're accessing one of the state office buildings or whether they're accessing the public spaces, we wanna make sure that that vertical connectivity uh, was, was readily available to them. So here's some of the final renderings for the concept design for phase one. So here you can see the 1801 Congress building on the left. You can see some of the things that we're talking about with some of the setbacks where the the plan setback of the office building pulling back to open up towards MLK. Within that space that we opened up, there's a small amphitheater next to the, next to the portal that provides vertical circulation down to the garage. That amphitheater is yet another way of activating the space. So we'd love to see things like lectures there during the Texas Book Festival, which is opportunities for the museums to even have visiting lecturers come and support their programs. The 1601 building is the third building down on the left, and you can see how it really does blend into the fabric. You look at the height of the building aligning with the William B. Travis building, the facade of it is aligning with that building. So it's really all about kind of framing that view of the Capitol. So here's a close up view of that amphitheater and the Texas Mall. Again, really trying to make this a space that can be used by all Texans, but it's really a civic gesture. So you can see the walkways on both sides with the trees providing a lot of shade. We have both kind of a, the very formal walkway right adjacent to the lawn panels, but then within the trees, there's a smaller, more intimate walkway. 
And along that walkway, there's some small spaces where we've got some picnic tables or play sculptures for children that really activate that space and give people an opportunity to engage with the Texas Mall. So this is a rendering of the 1601 building. So one of the things you might notice about this building is the materiality. So there's really kind of two primary materials here. And this is relating to the buildings that are adjacent to it. So first, the, the master plan does require use of the Texas sunset red granite of the state capitol, which really is a unifying element for all of the buildings within the capitol complex. And so we definitely wanted to incorporate that into the facades. But when we look at the facades, we wanted these to be modern buildings. We wanted these to leverage the most modern technology in glass so that we're able to get as much daylight into these buildings to have the highest quality workspaces we can for our state workers. I mean, our state agencies are competing with private companies for attracting talent. And so we wanna make sure that the state agencies have qualities of spaces that are compatible so that they can attract that quality talent to our, our state agencies. The two different materials here, we've got the granite on the left, and then on the right, we have a metal that, ref that is uh, reflective of a zinc material that was used in the Robert E. Johnson building. And so what we wanted to do was pull some of that materiality from the Robert E. Johnson building to really connect these buildings together. And so with the setback also with stepping down from a 12 story to a 10 story building with this setback, that also is following the requirements of the capital dominant zone to be more deferential to the capital. And so that setback really reflects the way that the building stepped down so that the capital itself can remain prominent. So then here's a front entrance of 1601 building. So a couple of things to point out here. So first we wanted to make sure that the entrances to these buildings were open and visibly open. So there's a lot of glass at the front entrance that's welcoming people into the building. The 1601 building has a lot of shared amenities to it. The entire second floor is a large conference center for our state agencies. And we wanna make sure that all of our state agency employees are feeling welcome to come here and use and use those shared spaces. On the mall, you can see one of the portals on the left-hand side of the screen. That's one of those vertical circulation nodes where we've got elevators and stairs bringing you up from the parking. And then also one of the play sculptures just sprinkled through the Texas mall. Again, making this a family-friendly space. So now, where are we at? So we've been making really good progress. So this is an image of our exterior wall mock-up for the 1801 building. So here you can really kind of see some of that materiality. And so we've actually got these granite fins, which incorporate that granite material in kind of a new and modern way so that it reflects kind of the verticality of the building, but also provides sun shading on some of those broad faces of what is a large office building. And so it was a very unique way of incorporating that granite material while still leaving a very large amount of, of glass and vision zone for daylighting and views of those office spaces to make sure that those are quality office spaces for our state employees. So here's the progress of construction on the 1801 Congress office building. Uh, I should also mention that this has been officially named for George H.W. Bush. Uh, we are working on some imagery in the lobby of this building that will reflect the life and history of George H.W. Bush. But here you can see the progress of the building. You can see that curtain wall going up with the granite fins, uh, really reflecting how at the ground plane, we have it a little bit tighter of the spacing on those granite fins that relates a little bit more to a personal human scale. And then the granite uh, fades away a little bit as you go up the building, just as we have uh, get a little bit taller, leaving that masonry a little bit lower on the building, which is more natural for that masonry material. You can also see some of the progress of the Texas Mall. This is them pouring the, the uppermost slab that's at the ground level for the Texas Mall. We're looking forward to getting uh, topped out on our mall. And so the office buildings are actually getting very close to the structure as well. Here's the facade. One. And so this a little bit simpler, but still incorporates the granite between glass panels, still leaving a very large amount of, of glazing and leveraging some of our glass technology with low E coatings to provide high energy performance while still allowing the natural views and daylighting into the office space. And here's the construction progress on the 1601 building. 
So you can see we've got this building, I believe, is almost topped out. It's 12 stories tall on the largest portion and then steps down to 10 stories next to the Robert E. Johnson building. The other thing you can see in this image is the Texas Mall, the Capitol Mall, and the below grade garage. You can see the five floors of below grade structure underneath the office building where we've not yet poured the, uh, the elevated decks for the below grade garage under the Capitol Mall on the south end. So you can really see kind of those parking floors at the lower level, which I think is kind of interesting to see. For the curtain wall that we were just looking at the curtain wall mock-up, you can see the first pieces of curtain wall just starting to go in up on the northeast corner of the ground level of this building. So making very good progress on these buildings. And then here's a nighttime shot of some of the work on the Capitol Mall. And what you can see here is how the work started at the north end and is progressing south. And so you can see kind of that progression where you can see the under slab vapor barrier in yellow at the very south, the slab on grade being poured, the elevated decks and some of the shoring and formwork, the tower cranes coming up, and then the elevated deck at the highest level at the ground level up at the very far north end. So I really like this image to be able to see that progression of how the other work is, is progressing along our Capitol Mall. So now I'm gonna hand this over to John Roth. Uh, so this slide is an image of the website. Just wanted to point out to y'all that we do have a website for the project, uh, tfc-ccp.org. Right in the upper right corner of the screen here, tfc-ccp.org. Uh, so you can visit that website for additional information. So John, I'll let you take it away here. Thanks, Paul, and an awesome job. Uh, really, really love to hear it all over again <laughs> in terms of how you present our, our plan, our, our grand plan. Uh, the, the, these first couple of slides are just to kind of help orient you in terms of the, the phases of the development and, uh, and more importantly, phase two, which is that medium orange colored uh, masses on, on the plan there. Uh, the dark orange is the south end of the phase one uh, development and the sort of mustard colored yellow is phase three. Uh, we are um, funded uh, to do phase two as of the 86th legislature in 2019. And uh, so that includes these two buildings, uh, one at the corner of Congress and, and uh, 15th, which is about 165,000 square foot building. Uh, five stories. It, it respects, as Paul uh, referred to earlier, the capital dominant zone. It's sort of a, a sister building to the John H. Reagan building uh, across the street to the south, uh, probably roughly about the same height. Um, and then uh, to the west uh, across Colorado Street is the second building, which is uh, roughly a 10-story building that encompasses an entire block, uh, city block. Uh, it's about um, 360,000 square feet and uh, has uh, a little bit of parking that comes up above uh, grade like what we have on the 1801 building, but most of it's uh, below grade underneath the building. Um, uh, another thing to mention is to the north of the first building, the shorter building there is what we call the sort of the garden district of the capital complex. It, it is the area that uh, holds uh, a lot of our historic uh, buildings that the Historical Commission takes care of and manages uh, the Covert Carrington House and the, the uh, Gethsemane Church and uh, education building behind the Gethsemane Church. And then of course the Catholic Diocese and the Elrose Apartments. Uh, so um, at any rate, these uh, the, the phase two buildings, if you want to flip to the next slide, uh, Paul, uh, is, uh, you know, what we're what we are in the process of planning. I'm, I'm very close to being done with the template contracts for the AE and the construction manager at risk and the uh, what we're calling the program manager or project manager uh, that we're going to hire to, to help us manage the project. And uh, so very close to being done with those and we're, we're just about ready to start putting some of our solicitations out on the street, I'd say within the next uh, three weeks. This is a kind of a rough uh, timeline that we've mapped out uh, for the project. Uh, as you know, 
these timelines don't really become real until you start signing contracts and you get people <laughs> under contracts and agreeing to uh, schedules and that sort of th thing. So this is kind of the owner's idea right now of you know how this phase two is going to play out. And uh, so we'll be buying our, our services through the course of uh, 2021, uh, including the uh, the project controls there uh, is actually this uh, uh, project management or program management uh, uh, consultant, which would be procured in March. And then uh, AEs in, in, in May and the uh, construction manager at risk in June, uh, shortly after the AE. And then, of course, a lot of the other services that we need in terms of, uh, you know, FF&E and commissioning and, and construction construction materials testing and those sorts of things later uh, in this year, calendar year 2021. Uh, you know, that design is uh, nine to 12 months is kind of an ambitious schedule. I, it's probably going to be a little bit longer than that, but you know, we could very well be done maybe with core and shell and, and things like that in 12 months. But, you know, obviously some overlap there uh, when you're working with construction manager at risk, you can do early uh, release of work packages and things like that to get get the construction underway. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, we think we'll be done in the early early part of 2026 with the with the phase two uh, project. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, these are just some images of uh, you know the the phase one project and uh, the fact that you know our plan is to be done. Uh, with phase one in the summer of 2022. Everything is pointing in that direction. Uh, our CMRs are on schedule. Uh, everything's uh, within budget and uh, uh, we're moving forward. So uh, next slide is the uh, North Austin complex. So let me just pause here briefly to say that our solicitation schedules are on our website. So uh, if you go to tfc.texas.gov uh, and um, and then go to the uh, popular popular site or popular pages and uh, select procurement and uh, on that procurement page scrolling down you'll find a, a forecast for all of our solicitations so you know if you're interested in getting an idea of when when our rfqs and our rfps are going to be coming out you can go to our website uh, this is the north austin complex it's kind of the the other half smaller half of of our uh, new building program that we're managing and we were also uh, authorized uh, with funding for phase two for the north austin complex and uh, you can see phase one is uh, uh, on the south end of the site, north is to the left, and uh, we are essentially substantially complete with that tower and that garage. Uh, probably within a week, I think, is our is our date, uh, very end of February, and uh, we'll be finishing that, the part that we're managing, which is the modular furniture and all that, in April. So, uh, HHSC Health and Human Services Commission is anxious to and very excited about moving into these new digs. And uh, they'll be vacating a number of their leases. And with phase two, we will vacate the remainder of their, their uh, office leases. So uh, that uh, project is 300,000 square foot office building, probably about six levels. And then a, another parking garage, roughly of the same size as the phase one, a few more cars. Uh, phase one's uh, 1,850, and uh, the phase two garage is, is uh, probably in the range of 2,000 cars. Uh, next slide. So this is just, again, sort of a site view uh, highlighting the phase two uh, construction. And uh, then we have the, yeah, let's go to the, the procurement schedule for this. Uh, North Austin should move a little more quickly than, than the Capitol Complex. It's it's less encumbered. It has less uh, fewer uh, uh, stakeholders and, and uh, oversight. Uh, we're working with, essentially with one agent agency, Health and Human Services, and, and uh, it, it just tends to move a little more quickly. Uh, and uh, so again, sort of that 
planning and procurement and design is probably roughly on the on the same schedule. Uh, construction may be a little bit shorter and we may be able to have a little bit more overlap between the design and the construction on this site. Um, it's a particular thing about this site is the is the uh, coordination of building the parking facility because it's going to take a lot of their existing parking capacity in order to start that garage. So uh, that, that'll be kind of a unique uh, aspect of this project is the speed at which we need to, you know, stand up the parking garage. Um, again, all of our information in terms of our uh, procurement forecast, you can see a, a, a web uh, reference down there in the lower right hand corner. And uh, you can uh, just keep tabs on that. It, it changes from time to time. Obviously, you know, things take us longer to get done in terms of contracts and things like that. But just, uh, you know, in terms of monitoring uh, our status, that's, that's a good place to do it. And is that the last slide? We, yes. So any questions you might have, uh, Paul, uh, on the architectural and engineering technical side and and myself on the on the owner side we're happy to answer all right well thank you both very much paul john uh we really appreciate it uh very very interesting uh presentation uh, obviously a, a huge uh program that's gonna uh, change the way austin looks uh so very impactful um, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and I'll, I'll ask them. We have uh, just one right now. Uh, Thomas asks, uh, I'm currently a junior studying architectural engineering at UT. In our intro to design course, we had a semester long project where we designed a building for the site located at 11th and Congress. The site is currently above ground parking. I was wondering if this site will be renovated uh, as I didn't see it included in any of the phases. John, do you have any insight into the site at 11th and Congress? Sure. Uh, for, first, I, I would just uh, sort of uh, underscore your statement that our, our first three phases kind of focused on, on North Congress. Uh, the the 11th and Congress site that you're referring to, if you're referring to the east side of Congress, that is the parking lot that's adjacent to the Greer building that houses the uh, offices of the uh, TxDOT. And uh, I believe that is in a, uh, a future phase uh, beyond uh, phase three, Paul. And uh, again, anything uh, on the west side of Congress uh, you know, you're starting to get, get close to the governor's mansion there, and we 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 have sort of kind of set out a, a boundary around that governor's mansion for obvious uh, security and and uh, you know respect for the for the historical structure that it is. Uh, but uh, on the, on the east side, I, I believe that's a future phase. Uh, it's probably pretty far down the road uh, in in terms of 30, 40, 50 years. When you say, Paul. Yes, that sounds about right. I know that the mass, if you actually dig into the master plan, there are quite a few phases beyond phase three the, that are lettered phases. And for those, there really isn't a distinct time frame for implementation of those. I know phase two, we've got some time frames because it was recently funded. So it's a little easier to understand, you know, where the what the time frame is going to be for implementing once the money's been appropriated by the state legislature. Uh, but for some of those farther out phases, uh, I think it's going to be a little while before they can completely into focus. Yeah. And just to, you know, to mention the obvious, the engine that drives this development is, is the Austin real estate market. And the fact that, you know, for many years we enjoyed, we are also kind of the leasing landlord for all of the agencies, in the state of Texas. I mean, there's a lot of them that are exempt from us, but we, we handle the vast majority of the leases for the state of Texas. And, and we enjoyed for many, many years, very low uh, lease rates. We were a very uh, dependable and, you know, constant customer for landlords. And, uh, but on the other hand, a lot of the stuff that we leased was kind of class B, you know, office space. And uh, uh, so uh, at some point, you know, those metrics change with the, with the, uh, growing real estate market in, in Austin. And it became 
you know, basically a reasonable uh, return on investment for us to build our own buildings and, and put those agencies in state owned space. So that's what we're doing now. And so those metrics, you know, have to continue uh, in terms of evaluating uh, future development. So we're, we're probably a good ways out. Okay, thank you. Oh, another question from Thomas. Um, uh, why aren't rooftop public spaces incorporated into the new office buildings being developed uh, from the renderings? There didn't appear to be any. The design of the buildings so there's a couple of aspects of that. So one is a cost aspect. We do want to make sure that we're, we're being good stewards of the state's funds. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, it's a little bit more costly to do an outdoor space up on a roof. We've actually made a huge investment and the state has made a huge investment in outdoor spaces with the Texas mall. The other aspect of this is a security thing. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to secure spaces if needed. So even things with the below grade mall, the way that the entries are treated, there's opportunities there for locking things down if needed, if there's an issue. And so we want to make sure that the spaces within the buildings and the, and the public available spaces, that there is the opportunity to be able to secure those. So I think having the public space be the outdoor space of the Texas Mall makes a lot of sense for how it was, how it was planned and conceived. All right, thank you. Uh, David Wheelock asks, uh, with the pandemic, have there been any changes in expected occupancy density in the new office buildings? Um, and then he's just following up. Uh, in other words, will the number of employees per floor be adjusted? Yeah, Paul, I'll, I'll start on that and you can, you can back me up with it. Um, most of the, okay. uh, and, and this, this question gets asked in a lot of different forms in terms of, you know, do you need as many offices as, as you used to? Uh, are you able to uh, leverage telecommuting, you know, and, and those sorts of things. And, and so, uh, you know, we've gotten obviously caught smack dab in the middle of a, of a possible paradigm shift in, in terms of how business is conducted uh, nationwide. And, uh, uh, with the pandemic and, and obviously I think uh, most businesses and state agencies are realizing you know some benefit to to the telecommuting platform and uh, so uh, one of the things that we find is that most of the most of the uh, surveys that I've that are conducted with regard to this you know indicate that most employees want some kind of connection uh, to uh, an office you know they they want you know they want a, a seat in a building or the availability of a seat in a building to, to call their office and to possibly you know want to uh, spend you know a day or two a week as a minimum uh, some some folks obviously prefer to you know to work full time in an office but uh, so you know we have that aspect of it we also have kind of the mission or the day-to-day -day activity of, of employees in state government. What is it that they do and does it require them to be in the office and that sort of thing. So I've sort of, in terms of that part of the equation and as a structural engineer, I sort of draw parallels to building parking uh, garages and you know, how many spaces do you build to, to support a, an office building because you know, you generally don't build one for one, right? You build as a maximum, maybe 80% uh, of, of the occupancy of the building. But, you know, now it's a matter of, can that go down to 60%, can, you know, whatever that number is. So that's, that's kind of a, an evolving question that we have. Uh, with regard to the other part of your question, I think, which has to do with, are we spreading people out more? Yes, uh, I would say that uh, there, there's been a kind of a, a small adjustment in that area in that, uh, you know, our, our, the, the modular furniture that we've been building all along is, is more or less provided that separation that's necessary, but we are tending to enlarge those, you know, very slightly. So I, I think there's probably a, a slight adjustment to a less, a lower density uh, in terms of modular furniture, but not as much as you might expect. So. Uh, Paul, do you want to add to that? 
mean, I'll say that, uh, you know, we work on a lot of different office projects, both private and public. Uh, across what we've seen is, is a, actually kind of a little bit of a mixed bag. And I think John kind of touched on a couple of these things that there's companies that are seeing telecommuting and, and you know, we're on a Zoom call right now and people are realizing don't necessarily have to get everybody physically together in a room. But then there's a lot of clients and a lot of, uh, a lot of clients that we have that are really saying that face-to-face -face communication is necessary. And building those relationships are necessary for their business. And so we're not sure that everybody is going to be willing to just embrace complete telecommuting aspect, that people are still going to want some of that face-to-face -face communication. But there's been a little bit of a balance in that it's a percentage of, we've got some people that can do their work remotely. That might reduce the, the number of people that have to be in the office at one time. But then also that idea of, we really want to give people a little bit more space, space people out a little bit more, so we, we're not as you know packing people you know into an office space as much. But those two kind of balance out, and so we're actually not seeing a lot of difference in the the total amount of office space that a tenant might take. Uh, they may pull back a little bit on number of seats, thinking the telecommuting can support it, but then wanting to space those seats out a little bit more, you know, then contributes to to then bringing that space back up to kind of where we're at. So been kind of seeing both of those factors that kind of balance each other out a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think we have one last question uh, from Michael Longfellow. Uh, is there any spe uh, bicycle specific infrastructure within the pedestrian mall uh, connecting uh, the Congress Avenue bike lanes through the Capitol grounds? We do not have a dedicated bike lane on the mall. Um, we do have uh, bicycle racks uh, throughout to make sure that we do support bikes. Um, and then also both office buildings have bike storage for the tenants and showers to be able to allow um, employees to bike to work. And so definitely the mall is intended to be bicycle friendly, um, but we do not have a dedicated striped off bicycle lane. Uh, we really do want people to kind of slow down a little bit through the mall. That was actually talked about during uh, during the master planning process of the mall. And so we really didn't want to have kind of a high speed bike lane through the mall. Uh, bikes are not prohibited on the mall, um, but um, we do want to make sure that it's it's still safe for pedestrians walking and for kids playing. All right, uh, David, I saw you snuck one in there. Uh, this one I think might be quick. Uh, what uh, what water source will irrigate the Capitol Mall? Potable or reused? Yeah, so there's a there is a, a reclaimed water source in MLK, but it's it's not convenient for us to to go grab it. Uh, it's a uh, you know I think it's a potential uh, future uh, use to be able to connect to it, but right now we we couldn't. Uh, develop a reasonable return on investment to, to go grab it. Um, the uh, we've we've looked at wells and wells are not an option. They're not a not a viable option. Uh, so right now it is uh, uh, potable water, and uh, it is uh, we we are looking at ways to of course the design which is uh, being uh, executed. Mm -hmm. Construction documents are being executed by Ann Coleman. Uh, are you know looking at you know very very hard at minimizing the amount of uh, irrigation support that the uh, landscape is going to need. Uh, we do ha have those obvious large lawn panels uh, that you see in all of the renderings that you know in order to to properly support those are going to require you know considerable amount of irrigation. Uh, again, with, with potable water, uh, those those would be uh, irrigated in accordance with uh, you know the rules and regs of Boston Water. So uh, you know we'll 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 do everything we can to to minimize that use. All right. Well, again, Paul, John, thank you both very much for being here today, uh, for being flexible with the date of the meeting. Uh, the, the last minute change was uh, not ideal, uh, but we really appreciate uh, you guys speaking to us today uh, and sharing uh, sharing what the, the new Capitol Mall is gonna look like. Uh, with that, Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Again. All right.
Thank you, Paul. And thank you all for your attendance today at our luncheon. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask our membership chair, Augustine Varengia, uh, can we have today's headcount? Yes, um, I saw 40 people as our max count today. Okay, excellent. Um, well, we appreciate everyone for joining us. Um, and thank you, Augustine. Uh, that concludes our luncheon for today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on March 23rd. Um, please keep in mind that this has been pushed back a week uh, due to spring break. Uh, so we did delay this meeting just a little bit. And so with that, um, we adjourn this meeting and we appreciate the presentation from Pape Dawson, or sorry, sponsorship from Pape Dawson, along with the presentation on the facilities complex. It's an ambitious project uh, that a lot of people are unaware of in our own backyard. So amazing work and a lot of firms in this group have uh, helped participate. So we appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you, thank you all. all, and Thanks, be generous uh, and help out the food bank or those in need. Um, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.